Second speaker is uh, Christopher McIntyre from the University of Western Ontario. Uh, he's a professor of medicine, pediatrics, and medical biophysics, uh, and inaugural holder of the Robert Lindsay Chair of Dialysis Research and Innovation. Uh, his team is a multidisciplinary research team focused on pathophysiology of dialysis and the effects on cardiovascular brain and gastrointestinal function and structure. Please. Thanks very much indeed. Um, Robert Lindsay, who my Dow chair is named after, is particularly thrilled by the fact he didn't have to die to get it named after him. So, so we're, we're, we're going to keep Bob going for as long as it's humanly possible. Um, thank you very much for the opportunity to come here and talk to you about not only the cardiac effects of dialysis, but also the cardiovascular effects of dialysis and how we can modify the treatments to ameliorate those problems. The standard disclosure slide. So having uremia, you are already primed for demand ischemia through a whole pr series of structural, functional abnormalities that are part of being uremic and the diseases that lead to uremia. So our patients, when they arrive on day one, are already a hand grenade. We then unfortunately do the next thing, which is we pull the pin out of the hand grenade by then putting them onto dialysis. So we take these vulnerable vascular beds and we subject them to the circulatory stress of the rapid removal of, of water and salt and challenge them hemodynamically. So that's a fundamental problem. And in many ways, the two stresses are also elemental. They are salt and water. And salt and water, when it works together, we term volume management in a world where the two are intrinsically linked. And of course, there is a large amount of truth in that, but it's not the absolute truth. We have the effects, if you like, the hydraulic effects of just removal of volume, pressure, perfusion, and all of those Guytonian type things they are all very familiar with. But increasingly, we're becoming aware that sodium itself is a uremic toxin and that can have serious effects from tissue accumulation that are independent of adding in the problem of volume. Now, each of these things on their own are bad. When you put them together, they are scary clown bad. The kind of clown that if you've ordered it for your kid's birthday present, your wife is not going to be talking to you for many, many, many weeks. So, hand grenade, scary clown. Probably all we need to remember from the talk. Um, the hydraulic effects is what I want to talk about first. And we've studied for some years now that the stress of dialysis of ultrafiltration and hypotension is capable of generating recurrent, sequential, segmental, and cumulative cardiac ischemia. We showed that in studies using PET. We showed that by putting people uh, in MRIs and measuring perfusion of their heart muscle during dialysis with an MRI. And subsequently, we've now confirmed it using very, very high resolution CT-based methods that are able to resolve the perfusion to a, a spatial size of less than one millimeter, just demonstrating the horrible heterogeneous perfusion that's very typical in our patients. You can see the red are the inter, uh, other ventricular cavities. The blue and green are the left ventricular wall. And that should all be one homogeneous color. That's what most of us sitting in the room it would look like. And even at rest, because of um, the pre-existing fibrosis and microcalcification and other abnormalities, these hearts, again, are primed for very aberrant patterns of perfusion. So if they have recurrent, repeated ischemic injury, what's the long-term consequences? Well, first of all, it's the factors that are driving it. So when we took our initial cohort of about 75 patients, we looked to see what were the things that predicted them suffering from myocardial stunning. That's what we call this segmental recurrent injury. And we had a great long list of things. Are they diabetic? Do they have ischemic heart disease? And all of them disappeared from the multivariable. The only things that remained independently were how much fluid did I take off and how low did the blood pressure go? And these factors were very, very powerful. If you take one kilo off, you're five times more likely to stun. You take two kilos off, you're now 26 times more likely to stun. And as you go up the scale, it becomes exponentially worse. Now, if you keep doing that to a piece of heart over a period of time, 
the inevitable consequences are heart failure. Oh, sorry, this is just um, data from uh, the MRI-based studies that just demonstrate the relationship between how many bits of the heart stun, and in this case, how fast the fluid came off. The key issue here is there's no threshold effect. It's not like the epidemiology. It is a continuum. More is worse, less is better. There is no safe ultrafiltration rate. In the same way, actually, this curve looks identical if we look at intradialactic blood pressure as well. So we repeatedly injure these hearts. What happens to them? Well, the light gray are the bits of the heart that at the beginning of a year were, uh, were, were stunning. And then a, a year later, they'd lost half of their contractile function. The dark gray are the bits of the heart that didn't stun. A year later, they're exactly the same. So you're generating heart failure in precisely the same anatomical areas that you're seeing ischemia induced. And this unfortunately translates directly to, through to survival. The top line is the third or so of patients who didn't stun. And in a year, nobody died. Every single patient who died in that year was somebody who exhibited dialysis induced cardiac injury. Our friends and colleagues from the Netherlands, Casper Fransen, has demonstrated very nicely that with each increase in number of segments, there's a, there's a further detriment to survival. So there's even a dose response relationship. Now, that's the kidney, that's, what, that's the heart, that's one vulnerable vascular bed, and is driven by ultrafiltration rate. So obviously, having residual renal function is critically important, because the less urine you pass between dialysis, the more fluid we're going to have to take off you for the next treatment. We know that hemodialysis patients lose that residual renal function very swiftly, much quicker than PD patients. So the question it was asked, if we stun a kidney, do we also stun, like if we stun a heart, can we also stun a kidney? And does dialysis result in recurrent ischemic injury and recurrent acute kidney injury? So here we have a form of perfusion CT scanning. The dotted lines are where the kidneys are. Um, as with all of these images, red and yellow are lots of blood flow. Blue is no blood flow at all. And at rest, there is still some blood flow to these remnant kidneys. After three hours of dialysis, no blood flow at all. Now, just as with the hearts, about a third of people didn't stun their kidneys. That's the blue line. The red line are those people who did with significant reductions. Now, why do we think this has anything to do with the dialysis? When we improved the hemodynamics during dialysis, in this case by cooling, and I'll come back to that, we were able to partially protect the kidneys from this effect in people who were otherwise being um, subjected to recurrent ischemia during the treatment. Now, it's ischemia, but it's not about large vessel disease. We particularly started to focus on that when we went to a model of dialysis that excluded large vessel disease, diabetes, smoking. And that, unfortunately, was children. And in a study of 12 children at Great Ormond Street that we performed, we were able to demonstrate that in all of the kids, they suffered recurrent myocardial injury. This is, the, um, this is a scan taken from a four-year-old. What you see here is the left ventricle, but those lines aren't how thick it is, that's how much that bit of heart moved over an average of three cardiac cycles. And after only two hours of dialysis, large akinetic areas appearing. But as I say, we, the youngest we studied was two, the oldest was 14, and all of them stunned. So this is a predominantly microvascular problem. Now, we're able now to study that directly because we can go even smaller than the children. We can go to the rodent. And in this case, this is a, um, a model of dialysis that we've instituted where we're able to dialyze down to about 180 gram rat. Um, we cannulate the femoral artery and return to the tail vein. The entire extracorporeal circuit is just under three mils. The pump speed runs at half a mil a minute, and the person doing this has very tiny hands. Um, <laughs> we then build our own dialyzers, which are about this big. They're absolutely adorable. I feel like giving these people for, for Christmas. And then we subject the, the, the rats to four hours of dialysis. We've been combining this with direct visualization of the blood flow through their capillaries. And to do that, we expose part of their, their muscle, and then we place that on a microscope, 
and then we directly visualize the flow of red blood cells through the capillary network in real time during dialysis. So here we have a rat at the beginning. Even after one hour of dialysis, there is a significant reduction. Two hours even more, we don't even turn ultrafiltration on until the third hour, at which point you have almost complete stasis. So now we have a rapid throughput model to modulate various elements of the treatment to be able to directly look at microcirculatory function. So kidney, uh, hearts are vulnerable, kidneys are vulnerable. What about brains? We know that dialysis-associated brain injury is universal. We know it's progressive. And we know that the level of cognitive impairment is directly proportional to the degree of injury that we can see on appropriately um, configured brain scanning. And that degree of injury is really very significant. This is some cognitive function work that we did to try and get a handle of it. It's very easy to demonstrate statistically significant differences in cognition, but it's quite hard to decide how low do I have to go before it actually interferes with my life. So what we decided to do was to use a uh, a newer version of a cognitive function tool, which is computer-based, and that this is designed to be done iteratively. So every time you do it, the games you play change. And our collaborators have performed this on around 900,000 normal volunteers. So we have a huge normative database that allows you to take an individual's performance and then show it as a Z-score to 50 matched people like them. Now, the first study we did wasn't in dialysis. We wanted to choose a clinical scenario that we thought nobody would argue must be significant. And that was people who were surviving nearly dying on ICU. The inclusion criteria for this were you had to be um, ventilated for at least five days, you had to be on at least three inotropes, and they were almost exclusively severe sepsis or post-cardiac arrest. The dotted line is where these people should be performing, each dot is their actual performance. And as you can see, across these different um, tasks, there's a very significant reduction in these survivors of very life-threatening ICU episodes. We then did it in dialysis patients who were within four months of starting dialysis. Very short vintage. And unfortunately, it looks almost exactly the same as the people who've nearly died in intensive care. So the magnitude of this injury is very significant. Now, if we're going to subject those brains to pulling the pin out to those stresses, the brain can still autoregulate it, can't it? It can still maintain perfusion over a range of blood pressures. So surely the brain can protect itself. So unfortunately, this is not true. This device is called a Respiract, and it uses our ability to modulate N-tidal CO2 to then use carbon dioxide as an endogenous vasodilator and allow us to have a very gradated test of autoregulatory function. At the same time in this study, we're doing uh, cranial Dopplers to look at brain blood flow. So here's a normal person. At the top, the blue line is their oxygen. We keep that the same. The CO2, we deliberately ramp up and bring down. And in this person, a normal person, they have an appropriate, an orange line, autoregulator response. However, this is from a dialysis patient. Again, CO2 goes up, but there is no response at all. These are completely energic circulations where flow has now become completely pressure dependent. We know that these injuries are progressive. These red areas are new white matter injury over a 12-month period. And we know that it's intrinsically linked to the dialysis itself. When we measure blood pressure every single heartbeat during dialysis, we can create a mathematical treatment of how unstable the blood pressure was. When we do that, we find that the most important and dominant factor determining the degree of injury is how unstable your blood pressure was on dialysis. It's possible to look at the perfusion during dialysis itself. Again, our friends in the Netherlands did this first using PET. These are data from a study that we're completing shortly where we've used MRI. So this is a patient placed in a high-field MR scanner. In fact, this is a PET MR scanner. 
and subjected to dialysis and multiply scanned. These images are arterial spin label MRI. So we take blood and we magnetize blood and that turns your own blood into an endogenous MRI contrast agent. Again, blue is not much blood, red is lots. This is at rest. This is the brain of that person after three hours of dialysis. So the reduction in brain blood flow we see here is about the same order of magnitude as somebody having an ischemic stroke. 26 patients studied, to one degree and another, they have all exhibited these kinds of changes. Now, we've shown that there's reductions in blood flow, but up to now, no one has shown acute injury during dialysis in the brain. The hallmark of acute injury is this beast. It's cytotoxic edema, where it's not fluid in the extracellular space, but actually the cells, the neuronal cells themselves, start to swell. And this is what leads then subsequently to cell dropout and leukoareosis, white matter rarefication. And this is a response to ischemia, but it's also a response to oncotic stress. So what happens during a dialysis treatment? These brains are of 17 patients. They're all squished together. And the colored areas you see are the development of new cytotoxic edema, which has a very specific MRI signature during dialysis. So even within one treatment, all of this brain injury happens. The brains then become very inflamed. We were able to see that by doing MR spectroscopy, where each of these peaks is a different chemical in the brain, neurotransmitters and other chemicals such as markers of inflammation. This is the MR spectrum at the start of dialysis. This is after three hours of dialysis. These new areas are almost all molecules related to inflammation or excitotoxic neurotransmitters that have been released and are perpetrating and, and perpetuating the brain injury. Now, I said these studies are done in a PET MRI. And the reason we've done that is we've also used a specific PET probe, 18 FEPA. And this allows us to visualize the inflammation within the resident macrophages within the brain. Again, red is lots of inflammation, green is not much. This is what the brains of healthy controls look like. These are the 18 FEPA scans of people on dialysis. So these brains are on fire with the level of inflammation. And inflammation in a brain makes the resultant injury from ischemia three times worse than if you have a brain that's not inflamed. Now, life doesn't get any easier for these brains. I said there were also oncotic changes. And many of the issues we see, such as headache and confusion, and that complaint of feeling like I've got my head in a bucket, are very specific to individual treatments. When we dialyze patients, their brains swell. White matter and gray matter increase. Now, ordinarily, because there's space in the head, that doesn't matter. And ordinarily, when you get swelling of the brain, your CSF volume also increases. So everything is balanced. CSF is really important. You have uh, about, um, you've got about 700 mils of CSF, and it floats your brain. And the floating in the brain takes its actual weight of about one and a half kilos to an apparent rate of about 50 grams. So if the brain swells and the CSF disappeared, your brain is hammered down into the base of the skull with many resultant side effects, such as headache and confusion. And unfortunately, that's exactly what happens in dialysis. It's the only, it's the only case we can find where volume goes up, but CSF volume falls. And it falls by about 40% during a dialysis treatment. So these are all bad things, and we're still on hydraulics, remember. What can we do about it? Well, we could dialyze people more often and nocturnally, and when we've done that, that does indeed reduce the amount of cardiac stunning. It also reduces the amount of endotoxin that's been translocating from the gut into the circulation, which is another consequence of these problems. We can make the tissues more resistant to ischemia. And you can do that by making them a little bit ischemic, ischemic preconditioning. And if you make a distant part of the body ischemic, like an arm, that protection is transferred to internal organs. We've demonstrated that in initial 
RCT of uh, using a, a blood pressure cuff on a leg, where we were able to halve the number of stunned segments. And we've just finished a larger study where we looked at different doses of ROPC and have roughly replicated those results. Ischemic conditioning, though, can also be done with exercise. And it can be done with exercise during dialysis. And there's an immediate effect, and there's a long-term effect. And when we looked at cardiac stunning during it, the patients, when they weren't exercising, increased their number of stun segments. And when the same patients exercised, that increase was largely removed. So we can help protect things. Now, why do we think it's ischemic protection and it's not helped blood pressure? This study, again, is data relating to very high resolution myocardial perfusion with CT. And then these patients were treated again, but exercised. And there was no effect on perfusion. They were identical. But when we looked at their contractile function, they stunned less. So from that, we imply that it was the ability to tolerate the ischemia that was the main means of how the exercise had helped them. The other thing we can do is we can help maintain blood pressure and improve hemodynamics. And we've been cooling dialysate for as long as we've been doing dialysis for. That has a number of effects. Among them, though, the ability to vasoconstrict and maintain blood pressure. We've done a series of, of studies looking at the available literature, confirming that it's safe and effective. We showed how it works by improving vasoreactivity. We showed that if we cool people, we can protect against cardiac stunning. But that was taking them to 35. And some people get cold and can't tolerate it. So then we did the dose response. How low do I have to go to get the benefit, but not the symptoms? And it turned out there's a sweet spot by matching it to just below your own tympanic temperature. And then we did a preliminary RCTs of people new to dialysis, demonstrating that if we cool them that way, we could protect the hearts and the brains. Everything on the right side of that line suggests that cooling protected the heart. And the brains, the red one, are the patients who weren't being cooled. That red is new white matter injury over a year. The green, with no white matter injury, absolutely none at all, zero, 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 were the patients that we cooled in their brains. Now it's a question of translating that. So this is a study that we're running at the moment. It commenced in April 2017, and we have randomized 7,500 patients to receive either conventional dialysis or individually cooled dialysis. As you can see here, we've generated good separation in the delivered temperature, and we've maintained that over the time. We, we randomly sampled 10 patients from each unit every single month to confirm this. You'll also notice that the patients in the control arm are actually dialyzing on something less than 36.5. There's a lot of people who already believe in cooling. But in here, this is the difference between body temperature and dialysate temperature. So even with a 36.5 intervention, you can see that a number of patients are still actually being warmed during dialysis. And we're needing to go even lower to provide adequate cooling. This study, as I say, started April 2017. It runs for four years, and it is powered for cardiovascular death and cardiovascular events as, as a hard outcome. So that's the hydraulics. What about the other part of the scary clown, the salt? Now, I just want to remind you that dialysis is a bad way to get rid of salt. You've got it on the dialysis side. You like to think that as you ultra-filter, it all comes through, but it doesn't partly because salt sticks to other proteins and other ions, and it's not available for diffusion. The other problem is the dialysis membrane coats with protein, and that makes it positively charged, and there's electrostatic resistance of the movement of sodium across it, to the point where some of that sodium is rejected by the membrane. Now, if that wasn't put somewhere, your cells would swell and you would die. So we are adapted to place this into other body components, and it's stored without water. And the classic ones are skin, muscle, and bone. And only recently are we able to really appreciate that, because now we're able to see it. We're able to take MRI and retune the MRI scanner to not listen to the water signal, but to listen to the sodium signal. 
So what we have here is images from um, a series of patients, normals, CKD, hemo, and PD. And this is a heat map. The more it glows, the more salt there is. So you can see, actually, the very highest levels were, in fact, in the peritoneal dialysis. We've studied around 130 patients now with sodium MRI, so we've got a fairly reasonable handle on these differences of being real. There are effects of age, there are effects of dialysis vintage, but the overwhelming effect is whether or not you have a kidney that can work properly. To do that, again, we've resorted to children. So if we look at a normal six-year-old's leg, it's not only small, it's not very salty. This is a six-year-old with a GFR of 15 mils a minute, intensely sodium loaded. And we're interested in this because, as Jens Titsa showed, uh, very preliminary, you can move it. It's missable. It's not locked into all of these components. But where it's, when it's there, it's causing a lot of bad stuff. It's recruiting macrophages, it's producing vasoactive chemicals that are liberated to the circulation through the lymphatics, causing hypertension and inflammation. This is the relationship between muscle sodium and albumin as a marker of um, uh, malnutrition, hemoglobin, and this looks the same for EPO resistance index. And even when we look at other measures of malnutrition, this is all linked to the level of sodium. The dialysis, dialysis concentration within the range we use doesn't appear to have very much difference. So these are tissue sodiums across the range of patients, what, what I'd say a conventionally used amount. So just tweaking it down a bit probably won't be helping. Could we, though, change how the dialyzer handles sodium? There's a new generation of dialysis coming out now that are characterized by having holes that are bigger but more evenly distributed in terms of their size. So that allows them to be bigger, but not spill albumin. So the question is, would a dialyzer like that be more permissive to salt? We have the case here, where the Gibbs-Donnan effect coats the membrane, and actually very little of that pore is electrostatically unimpeded. Now if we think about having a membrane with bigger holes, it coats with protein again, but theoretically, a much larger area, a virtual pore area, may be available for unimpeded movement. Now, when we study these membranes, this is using an iterative patient-reported measure to daily measure quality of life. We can demonstrate marked improvements in a lot of the common symptoms and problems that our patients have. And this, indeed, may also be linked to salt. Because when we look at quality of life, restless legs, and itch, all of these are well correlated to the level of tissue sodium. Now, we're in the process of currently directly examining this, but this patient worked as, a, as, as our first case study. This was a guy who was going to withdraw from dialysis because of intractable itch. He said, I can't take it anymore. He had had every single known intervention and tried every known dialyzer. He was a highly compliant, sensible, intelligent man, but his, he had torn himself to shreds. We scanned his leg for sodium, and he had the highest levels we'd recorded in anybody. We then changed him to a different dialyzer, and in three months' time, we had removed the level of sodium back down to normal control values. With that, his quality of life massively improved, his itch completely went away, and even his skin, from beginning to the end, managed to heal. With the only difference we made to his treatment, effectively, was removing more of the sodium. Now, what else might we be able to remove, and what other factors could there be that are, in fact, impeding this microcirculatory problem? Because in all of our human studies, we've always observed a reduction in perfusion very early on, before there's meaningful ultrafiltration. So there's something bad about blood meat membrane that's on top of the circulatory stress. So if we come back to our little, dial to our little dialyzed rats, we're able to visualize, in this case, two hours. This is the rat dialyzing on a conventional high-flux polysulfone dialyzer. We then cut up the same dialyzers that I just showed you and dialyze the rat using that. And in that case, at a similar time point, you can see there is actually a much better maintenance of microcirculatory function across the whole imaged bed. 
So there's the possibility that there are, in fact, factors that are clearance-based that may also influence these cardiovascular effects. So, last slide. Regrettably, I hope I've shown you that we treat our patients like dogs. And in fact, we probably treat the dogs better than the patients. Now, that's a terrible, terrible thing in itself. But the worst part of it is the patients have noticed. I encountered this patient in the dialysis unit fairly recently. This is not downloaded from the internet. This is a real person with a conversation. And this guy is a fairly simple fellow. He lives in a rural area. And he's been on dialysis for two and a half years. And I encountered him. And I saw this, and I said, you're clearly very angry. He'd had this added new by his wife after going on dialysis. So two and a half years, he used to come on transport with three people from his community. Small community, they all knew each other. After two years, he's the only one of the four still alive. He says, when I sit on the machine, I feel like garbage. I come off the machine, I feel like garbage. I wake up the next day, I feel like garbage. And then you bring me back, and you do it all over again to me. And I get the terrible sense that you people aren't doing anything fucking for me at all. And I wanted to remind you of that fact every single time you hooked me up. So I'm going to leave that there as a last piece of viable patient voice. And thank you for your time.